Hello and welcome to this uh, free mood talk for Django Con Europe 2020. Um, today we will be talking about my experience trying to create a Spotify-like uh, streaming service uh, for personal use with Django and View. So first of all, who am I? Uh, my name is Emma. I am the, the co-founder of a small company in Belgium called Levit. And uh, I'm the maintainer of the R schema adapter as well as Ember C like Fidities and other libraries. So if you've known me and seen me at other conferences, you might be wondering, are you sure you want to talk about Vue? You usually talk about Amber. But yeah, uh, I've been submitting talks uh, about, about Amber for a few years now, and uh, they always get rejected. So I thought, hey, Let's try something else and let's try you. But all that said, uh, I will be at some time comparing Vue to Ember. So first I had to get started. And uh, being a full stack developer, I like to have my front end in the same repository as my back end. So to do that, I, I wanted to have my front end at the same level as any Django application that would be in my project. And this is what we have on the screen here. Uh, to get to that point, all I had to do was to install a Vue CLI, which is uh, the CLI tool for Vue. We'll talk more about it later. And um, once that was done, I just had to uh, type Vue create front, front being the, the name of my front end application. And this is what I got. So in the front, you see there are three directories. There's source, there's test, and uh, there is public. Public is for any uh, resources like images and things like that. Um, source is where the main uh, code will be, and test, of course, is for tests. So <clears throat> the first issue uh, I encountered was to uh, try to have the two servers to talk nicely together, because Django has its own development server, but Vue also has a development server with uh, uh, out reload and other nice features. So uh, to do that, uh, you can see that you have a config file for you in which you can uh, specify some information. That config file is used for view and it, it is later transformed uh, to be used by Webpack as well. So the, the server is actually uh, not directly from view. And you can see here that we are proxying every request um, to uh, Django, every API request to Django, and also every WebSocket request to Django as well. So the other way around, I'm used with uh, Ember, and the Ember development server, whenever you make a modification, it recompiles everything and writes files to disk. So um, the only thing that you have to do on the Django side is to uh, create a template view that will just fetch the index.html that is created by Ember. This is not the case with Vue. Uh, Vue um, creates all the files, all the temporary files in memory and serves those files directly from memory. This means that there is no way from for Django to go fetch the file and display that as a template view. So an alternative uh, to be um, at ease in development is to uh, just redirect every, um, have a catch-all URL in your Django URLs and redirect everything that is not known uh, towards the view development server. Um, after that, um, I wanted some tools to be able to, to work with Vue. And uh, one of the major tools that uh, I found was uh, the browser extension, which is available for Firefox as well as Chrome. Um, there is a similar tool for, tool for Ember, React, Angular. So I knew something like that existed. You can go and get it from um, the um, web store for Chrome or for Firefox. And you can see here on the screen that uh, it shows you every single component that is rendered in view. If you focus on a component in particular, you can have its properties, its data, everything like that. There are several tabs to uh, look at what happens in different parts of you. 
The next thing that I found really, really useful was the cheat sheet. There is this PDF that's two pages long and that has all the life cycles of all the components, how to uh, pass properties, all the syntax you have to use and all that. And that cheat sheet is available at the URL that you see on your screen. And it is honestly one of the most useful tools that you can have if you're either new to Vue or if you have not used Vue for a long time, or even if you use Vue along other front-end frameworks because it's easy to get confused between one and the other. And finally, the next thing that is really useful is a CLI tool. So it's like manage.py for Django. Uh, you can use it to uh, create new project, to build your project, to uh, launch a development server. You can add new tasks. Uh, you can um, also add some, uh, some blueprints to your project. So for example, if you didn't select tests and you want to add tests, you can add tests on the fly to the projects and things like that. So once again, very, very useful. So before we go any further, let me sh give you a few basics of view for someone who is coming from the Django world. So um, there are two ways to use view. You can either uh, include the JavaScript of view in any uh, regular uh, Django server rendered view, and it will load like any other, uh, any other JS, like Bootstrap, for example. But in this case, I wanted a single page app. So this means that my application, my front end application, is going to have different routes. And for that, I do have a file that's called uh, router.js or router slash index.js. And this is basically the same as the URLs.py. It's going to uh, match the URL and send it to the correct uh, view uh, component. Next, we have app.view. App.view is very similar to your uh, templates-based HTML. This is the, um, the shell of your application. This is where you're going to put your menus, your headers, your footers, everything that has to always be on the page. This is where it's going to go. And finally, you have the components. Components, if you want to compare to something in Django, are like uh, super uh, inclusion tags. There are inclusion tags that are used everywhere. Every single page is usually a component, so it's uh, top level. Uh, is going to be um, included inside your app.html. So let's look a little bit deeper in those files. So as I mentioned, router.js or router slash index.js is the same thing. As far as JavaScript is uh, concerned, it's a bit like if you have uh, some module dot by, uh, or if you have some module, some module, and inside that directory you have uh, dunder in it dunder dot by. That's exactly the same technique. Um, if you look at this file. You can see that the URLs are defined pretty similarly to Django. So there is a path this is, uh, to match the URL. There is a name, which is optional. And uh, there is uh, a component, which in Django would be uh, associated to the view function uh, that's going to be um, actually uh, rendering the content of your page. And uh, then there is this app.view file. So first of all, what is a .view file? That's, that's something we don't know. Uh, it's a file extension that is uh, specific to view. Uh, and it's a bit messy in the way that it has HTML inside of a template tag. It's got JavaScript inside of a script tag. And it's got some CSS or SCSS inside of a, a style tag. Um, but we don't like that in, in Django. In the Django world, we, we like to have things clean in different files. So one way to fix that is to keep using the, the .view application and have really, really simple .view files that have three tags, one template that loads an HTML file, one script tag that loads a JavaScript file, and one uh, style tag that loads either a CSS or an SCSS file. Um, here on the screen, you can also see uh, on the bottom left the, the HTML. 
for this um, app.view. And uh, inside its HTML, there are two important things. There is the first uh, div, that's the ID app. This is where view will know it has to render. It will replace the div with the ID, uh, the ID app. And inside of that, you can see that you have um, a router view. The router view is where uh, the rest of your page that corresponds to the URL that you have been loading, the rest of your page is going to be rendered inside that tag. So those are the two most important tags in the view application. Um, now there's a component.js. Um, it comes with uh, some, some information. So you have properties. Properties are things that are passed to the component. Um, usually from another component, that uh, a parent component that calls a child component and passes some uh, variables. Uh, once again, same principle as a template, uh, an inclusion template tag. Uh, you have some data. The data is uh, local to the component. And um, you have some actions, actions. Uh, you have some methods. Methods are being called from inside the component. They can modify uh, the data of the component itself. And finally, you have computed properties. Computed properties are used uh, so that you don't have to do complex logic in code. So for example, here we have two computed properties that are going to be dependent on the uh, is busy uh, data. And when the is busy data uh, changes, those two computed properties will, will also change. And so if we look at the HTML for the template for that, uh, for, for that component, uh, you can see that uh, we do use the data is busy. And we also use um, some of the computed properties. So you can see here we are using columns, uh, column um, disabled, so this is an assignment to an HTML property, and so uh, this means that the disabled property is going to come from uh, JavaScript. We have an at click, at is for events, so when uh, the button is clicked, it's going to be calling uh, the method that is uh, listed here, which is download, and then uh, underneath we have some other assignments with uh, the computed properties. Uh, so now that we've gone through the basics of view, uh, we can look at something uh, more interesting, like how can we uh, get data from Django to view? So in this case, in a um, single page application, there is no way to have uh, Django pre-render the data somewhere in a JavaScript variable or something. So you have to call an API. And so as most uh, Django projects, when you want to have an API, you are going to want to use Django REST framework. So these are examples for a serializer in a view set for Django REST framework. But since I mentioned I was the maintainer of the RS schema adapter, I'm going to use uh, the RS schema adapter. And so here is an endpoint that does exactly the same as the two previous uh, view set and serializer, plus a few extra features like searching and filtering. Um, now on the view side, um, there are different ways to do things. The way I found was the most uh, familiar to me as a Django developer or an Ember developer was to use a series of things. Uh, first of all, Axios. Axios is a library that does HTTP uh, requests. It can be used with Vue. It can also be used with React, or it can even be used standalone. Um, Axios uh, just needs to be initialized. Uh, it takes a URL to uh, start with. And here you can see also the two last lines that are the configuration for the XSRF uh, uh, token and uh, header. Uh, this is really useful if you're serving your front end from the same server as your back end uh, and from the same domain. This means that you're going to be using uh, Django's, all of Django's security features 
including but not limited to uh, C surf tokens. Um, so you have to uh, specify those uh, information in the connection, and Axios is going to handle that uh, completely transparently. Uh, next to Axios, we are going to be uh, using Vuex ORM. Vuex ORM is an ORM like Django's ORM. Uh, the difference is that it's going to be uh, storing some data inside uh, your browser's uh, database. And it's every time you add some data from the API or from somewhere else, it's going to, to create basically a, a SQL database just in memory in your browser. Um, which is really useful, for example, if you already have loaded uh, a bunch of artists and you need uh, to look up a, a, an artist in particular, you can just uh, first check in memory if you have that artist before doing an API call to the backend. Uh, you can do um, requests like you would do in SQL with words, statements, and things like that. Um, and uh, here you can see how you, um, you register a Vuex ORM. What you need to do is you need to have a model definition for all your models, and then you simply register them to the database. Uh, the last thing we're going to be looking at is Vuex. Vuex is a state management uh, storage for a view. It is used by Vuex ORM, since it's in the name. It's also the standards used uh, with Vue. Um, and uh, here is the, the configuration to, to have it installed. And as you see, you, you can register plugins. And in this case, the plugin that we want to register is the ORM. And finally, uh, as far as the data exchange is, con is uh, concerned, we have the models. Uh, this is the artist model, and as you can see, it is very similar to a Django model. So you, what you do is that you list the properties, uh, the fields of that model. Uh, of course, you don't have as many choices as you have in Django. You basically have a string, number, date, uh, boolean, uh, and undefined, which is the dot adder. But you do have interesting things like uh, one too many relationships. So for example, if you look here, you see that the artist has many songs. Um, and this is a relationship that uh, works the same way as a Django relationship um, or anything else. You can just access it with the dot notation. You can see at the beginning of the file that I'm inheriting from a base.js file. So this is a snippet from the base.js file. It's, uh, it's got some methods uh, that are used everywhere, like fetch all, fetch by the filter, things like that. Um, since this is something that you're going to be using with all your models, I like to have it in the base.js. But if you're using the R schema adapter, you can uh, export all your uh, endpoints your backend endpoints directly to front-end models, and it will write the base .js for you, and it will write uh, your models also with every property and so on. So <coughs> accessing the data in the front-end, in the template, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can, it works exactly like, like Django, you can use the dot notation. So for example, if you look into this one, we have a list and it's going to loop over the artist.songs. So all the songs of the artist. And once we have the song, we can use uh, the song dot, um, uh, song dot file to get the, the file, for example. And uh, but you have to be careful. In order to be able to use the dot notation, you have to uh, warn the ORM that you want to load the artist with the song. So if you look at the JS code uh, at the bottom of the screen, you will see that it is specifying that it loads with song. It also has a word statement to, um, 
to filter the results. And if you don't use that with, uh, it will not have access to the songs and you will run into trouble. Um, this is a nice way to um, avoid things like n plus one requests. Uh, this is a uh, this can be seen either as a blessing or, or a curse, but it's how it works. Next, uh, if you want to write a single page application nowadays, uh, most likely you are going to be having uh, some live data. So for example, uh, in this application, which is a streaming service, you want to update the currently playing song, you want to update the list of coming up next songs and all that. So for that, you need a WebSocket. Uh, for Django, uh, on the Django side, I picked uh, Django channels and uh, here's the, the configuration for Django channels. It's a very standard uh, Django channels configuration. Uh, note that uh, we're using the authentication stack in here, which, um, is uh, always a nice thing. Um, and on the view side, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a package that's called uh, view native sockets, which is really handy. Um, what you have to do is to declare the sockets with some, um, uh, the URL is going to connect to uh, some properties, and then the socket is going to um, be emitting some events. And uh, once an event is emitted, it's going to uh, call a transform um, or a mutation. So uh, here, for example, when the connection is open, the mutation uh, socket uh, on open is called. And, it's going, and you can perform things uh, on open, on message, on things like that. Mutations is a concept which is really important in Vue. It's about the same concept as is in React. This is how you change data. You cannot just simply take some data and change it. In, in like in Django, you have to go through mutation, which is a concept that I'm not going to explain today because I don't have the time. But if you are going to be using React or uh, Vue, you really need to go in there and understand mutations. Next step is authentication. And this is useful since um, I want to be able to create my playlist. I don't want to uh, see my partner's playlist and things like that. So it's important that my application has some authentication. So authentication, there are basically two ways to do that for a front end uh, a single page application. Either you can go with token, which is the preferred way to do things. If your front end application is served from another subdomain, then your main application. Uh, if you are using a CDN or something like that to serve your front end, you will want to use tokens, but uh, since I this is a personal project, and since I'm a full stack developer, I want I like to use uh, the session authentication because that way I can once again leverage all the security um, tools that Django provides out of the box. So to have uh, session authentication working uh, on the Django side, you don't need much. You just need a login and a logout view that are going to be, uh, the login view is going to take a username, a password. It's going to check it uh, using the um, regular uh, Django contrib.o tool and uh, it's going to return a user. Uh, on the view side, uh, a little bit more code is needed, but uh, not that much. Uh, you have, we have here some actions that are defined in the store. So we have been seeing a lot of code that is in the store. So the store is what has to do with all the data that this, that uh, view receives or view handles in one way or another. So here in the store, we have uh, two actions, which are login and logout. And upon a successful login, we are calling a mutation, which is uh, out success. And that hold success is going to um, update the user that is stored in memory in, um, in view. So one, uh, once again, this is a mutation. This is really important to use mutations, um, but that's, that's the, the gist of it. So uh, login function, logout function, 
and then in mutation to be able to update your user on the front end. And once your user is updated in the front end, you can uh, use it uh, in a lot of locations. One of the most uh, useful locations is in the router, for example. So here you can see a route like uh, the ones that we saw in the beginning, but this one has uh, a meta uh, information. This is this, which means require login. Uh, which is called Recurry Login. And so uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen, there is this code that is run before each uh, transition from one uh, route to, to another route. And it will check if that route needs authentication. And if the route needs authentication, we'll check if the user is authenticated. And if the user is not authenticated, it, it will redirect uh, the user to the login page instead of showing them the page that they were that were, they were asking to see. So now we're going to be doing a demo. And um, here we have our application. It's got um, a queue of uh, things that are playing. Uh, and this queue is uh, always uh, fed to a stream. So if I click play right now, uh, I will be connecting to the stream. Which is, if, if you recognize the song, it is the one that is said is playing. So what why did I want a stream? I wanted a stream so I can be listening to a playlist on my computer and then uh, go to the living room and switch on my media player and uh, retrieve the stream or where it was playing. Uh, no, this is not, this is of course not the only thing that uh, this thing do. You can uh, search for information. So I just searched for girl, I got an artist, I got several songs. With these songs, I can just add them to the playlist. For example, if I go look an art at an artist, uh, this one doesn't have any songs. But uh, if I go look at Madonna, I see that I have two songs from Madonna. I also have her full biography, which uh, comes from um, Last FM. Um, since this is for personal use, Something else I wanted uh, was to be able to uh, download things from um, uh, from YouTube, so I can make a, a search on YouTube. And here I've I've got my uh, YouTube search results. Once I have them, I can download one of the songs. This is going to take a minute or two. And once the song is going to be downloaded. Uh, is going to be available in my playlist. <laughs> and this is the demo effect. <laughs> this one didn't download. Let me try to download another one. Maybe all my uh, ventures is being taken by the stream uh, from, the, from the conference. I'm not sure. Let's see what happens here. Yes, the song has been downloaded and now I can just click play and here is my song play so this is playing completely independently from the uh, from the from the stream and if i want to go back to the stream i can just uh, reconnect to the stream and um, and get back to my uh, regular stream uh, this um, works completely independently. And uh, yeah, here is the stream that's back up. It is still playing the same song. And uh, I guess that's about it for the demo. So now uh, let's move to uh, the conclusion. So uh, the conclusion is that uh, streaming is hard. Uh, the major issue I got with this um, uh, with this application is that I thought I, I thought I could just uh, push every MP3 song to the stream and it would work uh, correctly. 
and uh, it happens that it doesn't work correctly. It just works correctly with one um, player, which is Cody, because Cody does a resampling of the stream before playing it locally. Uh, other stream uh, players have uh, difficulties with um, um, having the stream uh, when changing from one MP3 to the next, changing bit rates or changing encoding or things like that. So the, the stream finally is the, is the worst part of it. Uh, right now, um, it's still, um, it's still not working properly, except on Kodi, uh, which is an issue. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, unless I ask Django to do the same work as Kodi and resample everything before uh, streaming, uh, I don't see that there's a, a good solution to that, except free encoding all my MP3s myself to make sure that they are of the same, uh, the same bit rate and everything. Uh, the next conclusion is that, as you've seen, Vue is not that different from Django. Um, if you are using the tools that I showed you, um, you can easily go from Django to Vue. Yes, it's JavaScript, it's another language, but it really uses the same concepts as Django. And uh, the, another thing you have to be uh, looking at, of course, is uh, the data. Don't forget that while we're using a UX RM, you are going to be um, using local data, and the local data is not always the same as the data in the back end. So you have to make sure to refresh that data often. And finally, mutations. Uh, <laughs> mutation is a concept that is completely uh, foreign to Django developer. Maybe you can try to think about it uh, like, um, if you are changing information on a model in a view on Django, uh, it will not um, it will not be in the database accessible to another view until you push the save you call the save method. So that's a mutation. And I've run a little bit over time, so uh, we can now go to uh, the Q and A, um, and that's it for the talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you uh, to the organizers who did a really wonderful job and were really understanding of technical issues. Okay, so uh, next one. Uh, yeah, uh, I have some about the ORM. Uh, like I never worked with that, so no, I no much idea how how this ORM in the front end works, uh, but I su suspect it's, it should be more like efficient or some way uh, uh, instead of using like a store. I guess the view store is something similar with the, the store uh, we use in React. I mean, it's like a huge uh, data object with like all the, the data you have uh, in memory. Uh, so, like, do you have an, any idea of, like, uh, a guideline to choose between, like, I, I want a, this data of mine stored in this uh, ORM in the, the front end, or as a, uh, like, in the store object, uh, yeah. The ORM, the ORM is part of the store object. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, if you're using the ORM, you're going to be using the store. Uh, it is, um, it's a double-edged sword. So, uh, if you start loading a bunch of data, if you load your entire backend database in the front end, your browser is going to be slow, it's going to be using a lot of memory. Uh, that's not going to be good. Uh, although, uh, if you look at uh, most uh, Postgres databases, for example, uh, a lot of them could uh, actually be running in memory on most uh, computers nowadays. Uh, if you are using Chrome, anyway, you are using uh, four or eight gigs of RAM just just for Chrome. Uh, so it's it's it might not be that much of a problem because that 
story is going to be removed whenever you close the page. Now, if you really uh, don't want to uh, use that all that memory, you can uh, directly use Axios, which is the the part that does HTTP requests. And you can just directly use Axios in your uh, view component to load the data, not put it in the store, and use it directly in your component. That way, it's not going to be stored uh, inside that store, but this means that every time you will need that data, you will have to do a, a backend request, which is uh, going to uh, be taking a lot more resources than uh, just uh, going back to the store if this is something that you already have loaded uh, in a previous request. Cool. Okay, so if that answers your question, uh, I don't know who's yeah. next. Well, I uh, have a question. Yes. Yes, hello. I'm Jens uh, from the Passive House Institute. We are also um, uh, going to implement um, uh, yeah, Vue.js uh, together with Django. Um, and, but now we are going uh, for GraphQL. Do you have any? idea or wh why did you choose Django REST framework over GraphQL or do you do you have any tips on that or what should be different? different? I do not have some tips on GraphQL. Uh, my personal take on GraphQL is that uh, I do not like it. The reason I do not like it is that it's uh, really easy for anybody to uh, forge a request in GraphQL that will just uh, completely kill your backend server. Uh, okay. It is possible in GraphQL to ask from some data to, to, to force the backend to make some joints on the database. And you, if, if you craft, uh, if you look at the requests that go by in the browser and you craft uh, something, you can uh, request the whole database at once with GraphQL. This is, there are mechanisms in GraphQL to uh, prevent that from happening. Uh, but uh, in GraphQL, if you're writing your API, in GraphQL, uh, you do have to always have that information in mind, that security uh, concerns, you always have to have that in mind, uh, which is something that you don't need to have in mind uh, with uh, Django REST framework, because you can the, the user can only request whatever you say that they can request. Uh, so this is why I usually go for uh, REST, Django REST framework and not GraphQL. So I've not looked into uh, the GraphQL options and I'm sure there are some perfectly nice libraries in view to use GraphQL, but I cannot help you with that. Okay, thank you, but it's also good information. Well, I'm, I've also uh, experience with Django REST framework, okay then. We can think about it. Okay, thank you very much for this information. You're welcome. Uh, next person. Uh, I see Adam is next on my screen. Uh, I, I think uh, everyone's questions are good. Okay. Uh, next on my screen is Verena. Verena, you are muted. Okay, so no question from Verena. Uh, next is Telmo. Okay, no question from Telma. Uh, Volker? No, I didn't really have a question. Um, I was interested actually in the thing that you are showing now, the uh, synchronization with the, with the backend. Um, but I think the, yeah, the base model is coming right now is uh, answering that. Okay, so thank you. Welcome. Um, I'm sorry, uh, this was uh, for Volker. I, I thought you said Walter, which is my name. Oh, don't worry. 
<laughs> it's, it's okay. Uh, I, I'm fine okay. as long as I get one question. <laughs> okay, may, may I? It's Volker. Um, I was too slow to unmute my microphone. Um, I have a question with regards to the VUXRM and the local forage plugin. The local forage plugin allows to use the indexed DB in the browser for offline storage. Do you have any experience with um, storing offline data using this combination? Uh, yes, uh, most of the time the data I want to store offline is the user information. So, um, as I said, when you log in, you receive the, inf the, the user information. So, uh, something I do is that I store the user information uh, locally in the browser. So, next time, uh, and offline, so next time you, use, you, you open that page, uh, I look into the information, I say, oh, we already have a user, so let me just try to uh, Make a request to the backend and see if we are still authenticated. Uh, okay. Since we're using session authentication, so it, there is uh, I have an endpoint that is uh, called me, and so what I do is that with this information I make an, uh, a call to the backend uh, to that endpoint. Uh, either I get a 403 response, which means that uh, I'm not authenticated on the backend anymore. Uh, either I get a 200 response if I get a 200 response, and the data uh, from that response is different from the user that I. Have stored in the offline storage I will log out the user and uh, if the if the, the data is the same I will uh, keep the user on and so the that user uh, can uh, be uh, usually I've got a user model and uh, I'm storing the, the, the user model from the VUXRM uh, data oh. okay that's quite nice um, do you use um token authentication in uh, any project that you do? Uh, I do use token authentication, but not uh, not in any view project uh, currently. Oh, sorry. But <laughs> no, it's, it's OK. Uh, I'm probably going to use one uh, starting next week. Uh, okay. But uh, so far, I've been using uh, token authentication on other projects that were using Angular, React, and Ember. But I don't think I've ever done one with, uh, with you. It's pretty similar from what I've read. It's pretty similar to, to any other uh, front-end authentication um, uh, framework. So uh, there are libraries uh, for using OAuth, for example, uh, or if you are using um, the Django REST framework uh, token, so the permanent token, uh, you can use that. I'm going to, to go yes. back. Uh, do. Yes? Yes. I, I do use token-based authentication in a project. Yes. So if you are interested uh, in an exchange um, besides uh, this uh, web conference right now, then uh, you can co contact me on Slack. Okay. Okay. Um, okay because yeah. I'm using J Django Knox because the base uh, token authentication of Django REST framework allows only for one token, and that is not uh, encrypted in the database. Uh, so we changed uh, to Django REST Knox in this case because there can be multiple tokens and they are encrypted in the database. Okay, that's nice. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so.